Good day, church. We are glad that you can join us again for this uh, May the 17th streaming for worship, Sunday worship. Thank you for making the time to join us. I know um, in many ways, it's maybe getting a bit more challenging for us to do it online, but we continue finding the grace of God as we come together in worship and worship Him. Psalm 105, verse 42 to 45 says this, For he remembered his holy promise given to his servant Abraham. He brought out his people with rejoicing, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. He gave them the learn of the nations, and they fell heir to what others had toiled for. That they might keep his precepts, and observe his law. Praise the Lord, the psalmist say, praise the Lord. I think these psalmists kind of continue to remind us that God is the God who keeps his promise. He will be. And we can constantly find our confidence in him, not in ourselves. I appreciate how the psalmist kind of put it this way, that he brought out his people with rejoicing. That in the Lord, we can rejoice together. Yes, we can rejoice together. We can shout with joy as his chosen people. But I, he also kind of conveyed the, perp, the, the fact that the way the Lord brought us into that place of joy is because he delights and he rejoices over us. And that's a great thing. That's a great thing. And so we want to come and we want to worship the Lord this day. Uh, let's prepare our hearts. As we enter into a time of worship this morning together. Let's pray. Father God, we worship you and we praise you. We thank you that you are God and you are in control. Doesn't matter what kind of uh, ordeals or challenges we may be facing. I believe each one of us, we may be facing different kind of things along the way. But God, you are in control. So Lord, we invite you even right now, Lord, as we set our hearts upon you this time, turn our minds and our attention to you in our worship. I pray, Lord, that you will give us a heart of rejoicing together. And that we're going to trust that you're finding joy and delight in us as we worship and celebrate together. Lord, we ask that you be glorified. We ask that you be magnified. And at the same time, we ask, Lord, that you build us up. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. I rejoice in your love. Worship with me together. Holy, holy Lord. My strength and my high tower, holy, holy Lord, you're the rock on which I stand. Holy, yes, holy Lord, I put my trust in your great power. Salvation is in your hand. Try it again. Holy, holy, holy Lord, you are my strength and my high tower. Holy, holy Lord, you're the rock on which I stand. And my trust in your great power, holy, holy Lord, my salvation is in your hand, oh Jesus, your faithfulness is to me a mighty fortress, I 
就心有乐，爱比就心有乐。Oh Jesus, Oh Jesus, You make me. Holy, holy. Let 
Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you paid the highest price. You paid all on our behalf. You completed, fulfilled the work that is needed to redeem us. Indeed, you are the Prince of Heaven. We praise you. You are King of all. We worship you. We thank you for coming to us, to identify with us to set us free. Lord, our praise will never be enough. Our lips can never articulate enough words. But I pray, Father God, that you help us to truly be a people 
that from the depth of our hearts, we will worship you. We will truly yield to you and allow you to be the Lord of every aspect of our lives. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you that you are our God. We thank you, Lord, for the precious price that you paid at the Calvary on our behalf. Lord, we ask that you forgive us for those times when we are so bent in our own ways. Even as redeemed person, redeemed people, so easily we just wander into our own things, doing our own ways. That we are not fully devoted to you. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, for those times when we entertain and things that are not honoring you and glorifying to you. And so often we may, as a result, become so self-focused that we fail to acknowledge one another. Lord, forgive us. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that already paid for it, for us. Lord, the name, the name of Jesus. And so, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you help us, help us to continue ever be drawn ever closer to you. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's supposed to give us victory. Yes, victory. Will you give us that, that we'll continue to yield to you and allow you to take us into the place you want to make us and build us? Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you that it is at the cross, at the Calvary 2,000 years ago, even despite of all our shortcomings and our sinfulness, that you have given us a position that's right before the Holy and Mighty God. We don't want to take that for granted, oh God. We just thank you. Thank you for the gift. So Lord, let indeed that our hearts, that our lives, that's the first song we sang. Holy, holy, holy Lord, that we truly will acknowledge your holiness and allow your holiness to draw us to be holy as a people that you desire us to be. Thank you, God. We ask that you restore upon us the joy of this, our salvation. We thank you that you rejoice over us. We thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you cause us to rejoice. And we want to rejoice continually for the great love of the Lord, the great love of God. Build us as your people, we pray, that we will come to place and we'll continue to stay in you and be your people. Thank you, God. Lord, as we're facing continually at this time with this pandemic, as a people, as a country, as a nation, and globally as a, just the, the people of this world, this is what we are facing together. It's getting to be challenging, it's getting to be difficult. But Lord Jesus, help us to continue to trust in you, that you are in control. And you're going to make, in your time and in your way, to set us free. We're going to trust that. Lord Jesus, we commit ourselves to you. In the time of, as we're facing this restriction and pandemic that we are in, and sounded like as we listen to the governor, to the mayor, to the president, it seemed like we need to maybe even continue to extend this restriction and keep on extending it until we're safe. 
Lord, we don't know what the future holds, but we know you are in control and we will continue to lean on you. And we pray that you will work in accordance to your timing and your purpose. That through this pandemic, you will continue to accomplish your perfect will. Use this as a means to draw us and remind us that we, as human beings, we have no answers. And as capable as maybe our, our medical professions and, and our leaders, maybe. Truly, Lord, the answer is only can be found in you. And so, Lord, teach us to continue to lean on you, that you will use this as a means to draw people to yourself. To yourself. We know the time is running short and we want to trust in you, in your sovereignty. Help us, Lord, not to ever lose sight of your greater glory, of your greater purpose and the things you want to accomplish. Lord, we ask that you take us, take us. Indeed, we pray, Lord, that in your, in your sovereignty, in your ruling, that you will bring solutions to us quickly, quickly, as you see a fit. Thank you, Lord. Father God, we know again continually there are those that work very closely with those who are ill with this coronavirus in the front line. We continue asking for your grace to cover each and every one of them. There are so many. Give them confidence in you and trust in you. That in the place that they are working, Lord, that they will keep looking to you for protection, for answers, for so solutions, and that you will continue to vindicate on their behalf, protecting them. Lord Jesus, we ask for that grace. For those that are currently being contracted with this coronavirus, struggling with it, Lord, we thank you that we have heard testimonies of those that have been delivered. We ask for that grace again and again. At the same time, we do hear many suffer and maybe even losing their life as a result of this virus. God, we only ask for mercy. And even in this, when we don't understand, we ask for your answer. That we can be found that answer in you, in Jesus, again and again. That our confidence will be in you. I pray for the families, the many that are struggling, even at this time, because a loved one contracted with the virus and in illness and even in death. But in Jesus, there is no real death. Help us continue to look to that as our answer and our strength. God, we ask for your comfort for those families. We pray for, even for so many that are just going through challenging time in this season that we are in. Maybe lost a job. Maybe not able to get the food that they need. Struggling financially. God, will you provide for them? Will you allow the church to be creative and how we can come alongside of each other and be a support to, in, to each other? God, we ask for that grace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you're sovereign. Thank you that you are leading. And we will continue to trust you. Well, specifically, as um, Brother Evan had a, brought it up for prayer, as he is still in the boot camp, five more weeks, he says. Lord, and in many ways, sometimes it's very intensive. God, will you give him the grace and strength that he needs? Watch over him. Thank you, Lord, for protecting him. That uh, even though there were some in the midst that were had a coronavirus, that they were not able to, they were not contracted to one another, pass it on to one another. So we ask for your continued protection. Lord Jesus, that uh, there are those hours that he had to stay up whole night 
to God, give him that grace. And his training will allow him to continue to realize that his dependence upon you, Lord. Lord, I ask for your grace to cover him even at this time. And that he will continue to worship you. Thank you, Lord, providing a means for him to be able to connect with believers, able to worship even during the boot camp. Give him that grace. For Nikki too, Lord, we ask that you give him that grace as he served with the U.S. Air Force in Japan. Continue, allow him, Lord, to have that added grace and strength for your glory, O God. And that he will be able to find time and to connect and fellowship with believers. Lord, we commit to you. Thank you for this time. And as we enter continually in our worship into your word, we ask for your presence, invite your presence, continue to be in our midst. And lead us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to give this time to um, Sister Linda to lead us in scripture reading. Hello, brothers and sisters. We're reading today from Acts chapter 26, verses 12 through 23. Acts 26, 12 through 23. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day, so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I, I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and, as the first to rise from the dead, will bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. This is the reading of the word of the Lord. Praise God again. Thank you for the time together and we can worship together. And we'll worship him in the word. Let's uh, seek him one more time as we uh, prepare to look into the word together, expound on the word. Lord Jesus, we can't thank you again. We continue to give this time to you. Holy Spirit, come, come. Teach us, speak to us, convict us, and draw us to be a people that will be yours, Lord. Thank you for the time together. Thank you for your presence. We invite the Holy Spirit to now, again, to teach us, to illuminate to us your truth. And we ask Jesus that you sit with us, even on this time. We come and listen to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> in season and out of season, that's what our title is. There's a fellow by the name of Ken Hogwin. He wrote, did a little research and wrote something called for is the uh, reason to believe. He had a kind of a website called Reason to Believe. He actually did lectures at uh, Biola University 
on Christian apologetics. And so he did a lot of research, and the research was really study on, on the reasons for why the Christian faith, Christianity, spread so rapidly from the time when, when, when the uh, apostles and disciples uh, carry on the kind of the, the mission that, that Jesus gave them, and it just somehow just began to spread. The reasons he said, well, the first three reasons he kind of said, because kind of God had provided the means during that, that time. That uh, in, in Rome, there's kind of, in a sense, there's an overall peace in Rome. The Roman government, they were in control, and so there's a little bit deterring from, from the war breaking out. So there's not like a war in that sense that causes difficulties for faith to, to carry on and spread during the early day of the church. Roman, they, you all know that they create roads, right? Road for, they call Roman road. And it's kind of make it possible for the for kind of people able to travel. And that's how poor, in many ways, able to travel. Right, uh, and to start promoting and, and bring forth the gospel of Jesus, and also the common language. Those are three kind of things during that time God just provided in that way. The Koine Greek, right, is a common Greek that's been spoken, like English today, spoken all around. That makes it much easier to spread the gospel. But besides that, there's kind of this kind of picture of that the message of the gospel was a message of, of the Christian charity, Christian bring forth the aid. This is part of that, that, that wholeness of the gospel message that Christians brought forth to care for those kind of underprivileged people that so many times in those days as the church began to, to expand, people are, there's no like a, a welfare kind of thing, like taking care of those who are in need. So church can step in to, as part of the wholeness of the gospel message. And also, in a way, kind of elevate the classes, elevate the, the women, elevate the, those slaves, and, and kind of elevate the classes. That's kind of part of the message, the wholeness of the gospel message. So, Christianity came in to kind of put away a lot of those distinctions, class distinctions, and to elevate people. Part of that is also is really the whole gospel message, the gracious plan of the salvation. And we, we read that as then the guidelines in our reading. Really, it's really Paul's message, the gospel message, the power of the gospel to able to save able to save. And so this, this, this kind of overall, a, a kind of like universal faith, the Greek Gentiles, along with the Jews, are all included, all people of all, all ethnicity, that this gospel is reaching out to. And that's a, a message that the world has been waiting, longing to hear, in that sense. Of course, there's also the courageousness of the martyrs. In, in a sense, even though in the Roman Empire at that time, there may be overall peace, that there's not a lot of war taking place, they were persecuting Christians. But Christians were courageous because of their confidence. It's also again the part of the wholeness of gospel, the, 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 the confidence of the resurrection. And Paul continued using that as his point when he speaks. But because of that, there is an essence of that they are committed. There is a commitment of the believers to this good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then so all that is kind of in, in part of his study, he found that Paul, Apostle Paul himself, God had used him uniquely to bring forth. He was undeterred. Passionate, same thing as all those being martyred, Christians being persecuted, to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that was why the reason the gospel just began to expand, starting from the early church and all the way to us. This is again somewhat what we have witnessed and examined in the book of Acts, right? 
is the work of the Holy Spirit, inspiring God's people. Paul indeed was passionate and undeterred by the message of the gospel. After Jesus kind of grabbed hold of him, right? That's really what, it, what the passage we're looking at today a little bit. God used him and powerfully, therefore, to advance the gospel of truth, both to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Literally, literally, right? But by this early church, Patriots, right? They, they, they turn the course of the history. And the very reason today, even to us in our generation, we are privileged to able to have the gospel carried to us, even to our day. We want to kind of examine this again just throughout the passage today, okay? Again, Paul's passion for the gospel is the kind of the only mean for life. For salvation. And this is so evident for Paul, it cannot be mistaken in that way. Paul stated to young Timothy as he was about to come to an end of his life in 2 Timothy 4 2. He challenged Timothy this Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. What Paul is kind of conveying to young Timothy is simply this. When it is convenient and when it's not convenient, right? We are to proclaim and to carry on this whole counsel of the gospel. That's kind of what Paul urgently encouraged and challenged in the young Timothy. There are those times in our ignorance, right? We'll have no ear to really hear, no eyes to see the truth. But God continues to work patiently with us. He opened our eyes so that we could see. And so he ministered to us. And in the same way, Kind of what Paul is challenging young Timothy is that then God's call for him, for young Timothy and for the church. Likewise, we are to do the same for others. We are to do the same for others. Today's passage as Paul had really been taken into custody as we already uh, been looking at together because of his faith, his conviction of the resurrection of Jesus. Right, that's always his message. And so we read, we study a little bit uh, before uh, Governor Felix, uh, Acts 24. They couldn't find anything wrong to charge him with, but left him in prison in Caesarea for two years. Two years. Eventually, Festus kind of succeeded him. And Festus, and chapter 25, we didn't get to look at that. In, in, in that sense, but, but he was he, more interested, Festus is more interested to please the Jews than to do what is right. Again, it's the same thing. If you look through the chapter 25, cannot find anything really wrong. What, what Paul has stood for and that they can accuse Paul of. Right? But again, again, it's kind of the same thing. He, he doesn't want to, to kind of praise it and to make a decision on his own. And so he, likewise, just continued left Paul in prison, in a sense. Paul, in chapter 25, appeared appeal to Caesar. And so uh, it was uh, Agrippa came um, at the end when we were going to look at it. Uh, basically, is that uh, he just simply said, well, you appeal to Caesar, and then Caesar, you will go. And that's eventually, we will look a, a little bit of that later on as um, you'll be going forth to Rome, as even the Lord Jesus has said that will happen. But then the point is, even as Festus cannot make a decision and left him in prison, then King Agrippa came. That's kind of the background of, of it a little bit. So Agrippa decided that he wanted to hear from Paul himself. right? And that's kind of where our passage is at. The verses today is part of Paul's defense before King Agrippa. 
Just like Acts 22, Paul, before the mob, he was sharing his testimony. So here, Paul is before Agrippa, he actually shared his testimony and then his defense as well. This time, we want to just examine a little bit more in detail of Paul's testimony. Okay, a little bit more in details. What we can learn from Paul's model and patterns of his call, and as a result, the how he began to encounter, because of the encountering of this living gospel, how that affects Paul, and it should affect us in that way. Paul's life and his call, if we, again, just kind of, can, if we get to read a little bit, we didn't get to read it, okay, because I'm trying to save some, uh, some time, a, a long passage. Verse 4 to 11, basically, uh, again, is really what his life was like. He was raised very religiously as a Pharisee, convinced and strongly opposed in the name of Jesus, convinced that this, this uh, a cultic group and, and, and he strongly opposed the name of Jesus. Very adamantly, Paul persecuted the follower of Jesus. And that's kind of what we read in kind of verse 1 to 4 in a sense. And in an essence, Paul was saying before that the, until the heavenly visit from Jesus, right? Vision from Jesus. He was very religious, but blind. He was very zealous, but zealous for the wrong cause. And to King Agrippa, so verse 13 and 14, he says, About noon, so he was sharing his testimony, right? As I was in the road, I saw the light from heaven, bright, brighter than the sun, blazed around me and my companion. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It's hard for you to kick against the gods. Verse 13 and 14. Paul was kicking against the gods. What's gods? It's a kicking against the, what is the called? The pricks. The pricks to, to kind of get the animal to, 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 uh, to behave or to move in certain direction, right? Figuratively, it's kind of saying he's actually resisting or fighting the authority. And in this case, the authority Jesus. That he struggled against. He was struggling against the one who had appointed him, Jesus. And his appointment to be the, the instrument that God wants to use him. So Jesus can kind of say he's actually kicking against the prick, pricks. It's hard. It's hard. I wonder if we if I if we just look back in our own lives, can we identify with Paul in this way? Can we? That literally we were blinded spiritually. We couldn't see the gospel truth. And in many ways, we were like kicking against the gods. I was like that. I, I, I share many times about my story. I like superheroes, right? I hate bullying because I was being bullied. Zealous. I was zealous. I, I wanted to kind of to stand up for a cause on my own, in my own right, in my own eyes. But I was blinded. I was blinded from my from the spiritual truth of my own sin, my pride, my self righteousness. You know, Paul literally has all the glamours of a successful religious zealot. And so, in that same sense, if you want to come say he was blind spiritually until Jesus literally knocked him off his horses. And cause him physically blindness until his spiritual eyes would open. And a lot of times, sometimes God allows us those things to get our attentions, right? To, so that we can see. Paul was blindly persecuting God's people. In reality, as Jesus said in verse 14, he was actually persecuting Jesus unknowingly. I am Jesus whom you persecuted, the Lord replied. 
Jesus call of Paul here was to be the Lord's faithful servant and to testify to all that Jesus had bestowed for him. You know, it's interesting, it's interesting that in Paul's own life, he was persecuting Jesus, but then Jesus grabbed hold of him, right, with the gospel and made it known to Paul. So that Paul is to be his servant, to be witness of Jesus. Testify to what he has seen and will be seen how Jesus is doing. Verse 16. Paul was persecuting the church, but then as he became a believer, he was being persecuted by people, both by the Jews and by the Gentiles. <laughs> Interesting, right? So in the people in this, these zealot eyes, they are blind too, right? People were persecuting Paul, and in that sense, because Paul now representing Jesus. So in that same sense, these people persecuting Paul, they actually persecuting Jesus also. But Jesus grabbed hold of Paul. And so the kind of point here is that Paul is now becoming a Jesus instrument to grab hold of those that were like him before, to bring to light. Paul's call basically is this. He was blind. He persecuted Jesus. And Jesus has shown him mercy. And now, knowing that others were persecuting him, in reality, they were persecuting Jesus because they were blind, right? So now Paul is sent to them so that they will be spiritually be open, the blind eyes will be open and receive the same mercy as Paul had received. That's kind of really the call that God had Paul. How blind are we? How blind are you, am I, when we reflect back of before Christ, before Jesus? I wonder if all of us can relate to Paul's call in that way. Sometimes, you know, it's harder to really be able to see our own blindness. When our lives are not all messed up, right? So, sometimes we hear the people that their lives are all messed up. And then when Jesus touched them, oh, they, they can say, oh, yeah, my life was really a mess. And they can really testify the power of God. But, but a lot of times for us, sometimes our life is not in that kind of situation. And so we don't feel like we don't really have that life transformation story to tell that we've been redeemed. For me, I, I think, you know, it's that I have, really have to say, really, God's grace. God's grace. Yeah, I, I had, you know, when I was younger, I was being bullied, and there were those, some of those issues of growing up years, right? But overall, my, my, my years as I was growing up was actually not, a, not really such a tough years. I was kind of sheltered by my parents in that way. I didn't have to go through many of those hardship as a lot of times you hear those testimony of those people maybe you know in, in, in desperation in gangsters and things like that and then God turned them around. No, I was pretty sheltered. There was no harshness of life. Really for me, I really feel like I really don't have those exciting stories, right, to share in that sense. I could very well be kind of be a really a religious in that sense and just being religious only. And I for a long time, for a period of time, that's what I was. I think that's in, in some way Paul, if you look at it, look look at Paul's life, he he, he also in, in that situation. Probably, you know, look at his own past life, he was quite successful. There really is nothing that he would need to alter in that sense. He could just kind of keep to be religious, have his status quo, and receive the praise and recognition from religious peers without the real need to kind of be stirred up the part. But Jesus stirred up his part. 
after the encounter with Jesus, the Lord allowed Paul to see clearly of himself as one of the worst sinner. You know, even if our life is not always in that kind of messy situation, but as the Lord revealed it to us, I hope we can really begin to see like the way Paul sees it. That actually, you know, for Paul, he actually marveled again and again throughout the epistle, throughout his writings, the grace that was given to him. I really think, really, right, we really need to allow the Spirit of the Lord to search us, to come to a place where we can kind of identify what Paul began to able to see that. For Paul, it was in this state that Paul truly understood after that Jesus can stir his part, understood the gospel message, and, and we then began to commit him to the gospel truth, even at the cost of his life. In that way, Paul was extremely grateful for the gospel truth. That he will even say, I'm the worst of all sinners. He, he was able to come to a place of sin. The message, again, right? The message for Paul, it, before Agrippa, as it was shared in verse 18, right? He accounted and testified of Christ's work. This verse 18 actually is... Uh, Kind of Linda's regular prayer verse, I, I, I think. That uh, for those who are blind spiritually, I, I, I appreciate how she likes to kind of use this as a prayer verse in our way. Then those that need to be able to see the truth. The prayer is the, the verse, and Jesus actually conveyed that, okay, for what Paul needs to be doing is to bring about that Jesus' word. Right, and this is the heart of Jesus to open their eyes, the eyes of the, the, those who cannot see spiritually, and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sin and be placed among those who are sanctified by faith. Jesus said, In me, that's in Christ. The gospel truth. What's the gospel truth? Here again is that Jesus will want all who are spiritually dark in darkness to be able to come to the light of life. And from the domain of Satan, those who have been, been trapped, right? Those in darkness are in the domain of Satan to bring them to God. This is the heart of God. This is the heart of Jesus. It is only when we, our spiritual eyes are open then we will be able to real, have that real faith, faith in Jesus. And it's there that people can truly receive forgiveness of sin and be placed fully right, fully right, and be made completely holy in Jesus. This is a powerful scriptural truth that Paul grabbed hold of. A statement that Paul quoted really from Jesus himself, and so it is the heart of Jesus. And it is the heart and the passion of our Lord himself. So definitely it is important for all of us. It should be our prayer. Yes, it should be our prayer. Praying for the unsaved ones at all times. Along with these two gospel statements that also Paul stated in, in this defense before Agrippa. Verse 23, he says that the Messiah will suffer and as the first to rise from the dead, will bring message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. Verse 20, Paul said in defense, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. This speaks of God's heart, right? Christ's complete work of salvation. If you put these statements that Paul is making, defending before Agrippa, this is what is conveyed in. It is that Christ complete the work of salvation, of revealing, he revealed his plan. And Jesus brings deliverance. It is only in Christ 
the forgiveness and his work of sanctification to make us holy. And he also conveys the role for each of us, our responsibilities to repent and to have faith. This is to seal this salvific act of God. These are God's essential truth, the heart of the gospel essence. Yes, this is God's gospel essence. So brothers and sisters, we must not become so lax with this conviction. I know it's kind of something we heard of many times, but we cannot be lax in this conviction. We need to allow the Spirit and allow God's Word to refresh us of this truth. This is what convicts Paul so that he becomes so passionate. Right? To renew us again and again of this truth. We need the Lord to renew us in this. When we have this kind of strong conviction of this gospel truth, I believe it will move us to be passionate for the Lord, for the gospel, and it will move us to be passionate for the lost at all costs. We may not have so many so-called exciting stories, but when we are convinced by this gospel truth, it will move us. We will desire to see the lost to be part of those being forgiven and being saved. It will, I believe, if when we allow the, the gospel truth to continue to just, just stay in our hearts in that way, it will move us from being mediocre Christians into one who is passionate for Christ and the gospel and urgently desire to see the unsaved. For Christ. In season, when it's convenient, and out of season, even when it's inconvenient unco for us. It drove Paul into obedience. This is what really what he stated in the midst of being falsely accused, it that did not deter Paul. In the midst of being persecuted, left in prison facing death, yet passionately he followed Jesus' call and reached now and relented in our way. If we look a little bit on verse 19 to 23, we cannot see that Paul really recount these reasons, right? That why he was on trial before Agrippa and why he has been persecuted. He said, Really, right? An, an account of, of really understanding this gospel. He was obedient to the call from above. Verse 19. Our call from serving God, when we understood that it has to be from above, it had to be realized that it's from Christ, not of our ambitions only, right? We need to truly obey. That's kind of the call. It causes Paul to be faithfully staying and standing on what is the truth of God's word. He says what the prophets, the Lord had said in verse 22, he is not saying anything false. In fact, those, the laws and the prophets, they confer to really the message of this gospel that we need this Savior from above. And because of he realized of the God's big heart to all people, gospel is for all, for Paul. He mentioned it, so he was being faithful to the Jews, to the Gentile alike, to small and to great alike, to even to those who act, may act like the enemy of the cross. He continually to be faithful in proclaiming. You look at verse 20, 22, and 23, that seem to be what Paul conveyed it. And that he will continue to do so for Paul to trust God in his calling and for God to come through to help. We see that in verse 22. I think this is a little bit really what that Ken Hogwin uh, 
what I mentioned before in his study show. That despite the persecution for the believers throughout history, right, God's people understood the truth of the gospel, the power and the hope of the gospel. And they will use any means that God has provided to faithfully carry out the gospel message to all people. And that's the reason the gospel spread like wildfire throughout the world. That's the reason for this rapid spreading of the Christian faith, as Ken Hogwin stated. Paul shared his conviction, but it cannot just be Paul's conviction, though. I think to all of us who name the name of Jesus, this has to be for our call as well. The call that Paul had has to be the call for us as well. Sometimes it's so easy to just think, well, Paul is a great guy. And so this is specifically for Paul. We see Paul indeed was very passionate for the call. But this must also be for our call as well, right? Not just his, it must be ours, the call of Christ. Because this is the heart of God. Without this, kind of seeing the gospel, able to see the gospel, we are blinded. We may be feeling like we are so okay in our own ways. But in reality, like Paul, in my own life before Christ, it is like we are blinded. We cannot see our own sinfulness, the depravity of sin in our own life. Brothers and sisters, this is what Paul endured for this gospel. Throughout the history, this has been a hallmark for those who carry the gospel. To serve the Lord, ministering to those who, who are lost in the world. To bring hope and even silencing the oppressors. This has always been the gospel message. Again, the heart of Jesus is that as he sent and sent it out to to, to Paul and spoken by Paul here is that it is to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sin and place among those who are sanctified by faith in Christ. As he helped Paul through it all, we can be sure if we are faithful to God, he will help us in this manner as well in our ordeals and whatever we're facing. You know, we are in a season of challenge right now, no doubt, right? With this pandemic. But as many churches begin to realize, and the church may go, may not go back to the kind of the, the old normals that we are accustomed to for a while. Not anytime soon. And this may cause some of us to feel apprehensive and disoriented. It definitely caused me to feel that way a little bit. But with this reality and this challenge, I hope it, nevertheless, as we, the people of the gospel, it will cause the church to rise all the more and stay true to our call. If we need new vision, we will seek God for new vision. If we need to be, to be creative, we will be creative to continue advancing the truth of the gospel. If we need help, we will call out to the Lord for help. Right? But we will not let this pandemic to cause us to lose our calling and our mission. Historically speaking, History has shown us church actually rises in the midst of adversity because we serve a living God. We serve a living God. In my prayer, I pray a little bit about for Evan, brother Evan. I had a conversation with him last uh, week. Real time for him to able to even get on the phone to make a call. But he was telling me that in his training, he's getting to be very tough. He's not accustomed to it. 
he says he's not that disciplined, you know, and, and, and now, until now, now he faced this, he had to be, become very extremely disciplined. He had to get up really early in the morning, every day. And then there are those days that he had to take turns to be what is called a fire guard. You know, stay up the whole night to guard and protect those who are, you know, at, at the camp, so-called. He cannot doze off. He cannot say, oh man, I'm so tired. I'm just going to take, take a little seat somewhere. Alert the whole night. And they had to take turns in doing that. He shared how difficult it was for him and realized that, you know, in this training, that he, he in many ways, it, it caused him that he had to, to you know, it, it really required a lot from him in that way. But he realized that part of it is really an, a training for the real mission. So as difficult as it is, he's learning to adjust and to adapt. So in that same sense, as we, even in our time, we may face challenges. COVID-19 indeed is a challenge for our generation nowadays. But were we able to rise up and to adjust even in that way? Because ultimately, it is this gospel, right? In season and out of season, will we stand firm? When it's time, it's convenient, and at time that's not convenient, will we stay firm? Will we be convicted of this gospel truth? I think that kind of really poor, illustrate and poor, live it out for us, model it for us, right? Will we have this conviction of gospel truth? Yeah, maybe, you know, now we are in the out of the season, right? In, in a season that are not convenient for us. With this great restriction from so-called the old norm, we are experiencing that. But we must continue seeking the Lord. Allow Him to remake us and become even stronger for the gospel's sake. Until Jesus comes for us. So I'd like to challenge that we do that. Sometimes we look at the example of Paul and we say, oh, Paul is a great guy, and we just left it with him. But I'd like to encourage and challenge. What Paul modeled for us, hold it to heart. In season and out of season, we will live and deter for the gospel. Will you continue seeking the Lord with me for this grace together? Together for this grace. I'd like to ask that we conclude with this song, to be faithful, to be faithful. I want to be faithful. There are lost times we will not always be faithful, but God grant us that grace to give. So many times I fail, and I have turned away. I will never for you are so faithful. I can just see you, all oh, that is just and true, best of me more of you, I am your servant, I want to be faithful. Righteousness, I want to. 
Poor stated even before Agrippa, I have not disobeyed the vision from heaven. Lord, I pray that we will obey, we will choose to obey. We want to obey you. Not obey out of obligations, but obey because we are grateful. Lord, I ask that you will show us continually where you brought us from. It is so easy, O oh God, to kind of discredit of what we were. We make light of sin, the depravity of sin. And we don't appreciate the gospel fully. Lord, I pray that you help us as your people, that we will become passionate. We will be convinced of the reality of the gospel that saves us. And we will not be deterred from in season and out of season to be faithful to your calling. God grant us that grace. Will you receive God's blessing together with me? to the great God who truly is to worship the great holy and loving God who grant us that grace when we don't deserve through Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the marvelous grace and we will embrace it again and again. But we want to be grateful. And I pray that the Holy Spirit you are going to our brothers and our sisters continually with a passion, with a fire, like Paul. That we will continue to be your instrument, faithful, even in the midst of adversity, to carry on the wholeness of the gospel. Nor be with our brothers and our sisters from this day onward until forevermore. Grant us this grace. Amen. Thank you. Here we end our worship this day again and continue as I always want to encourage from uh, Dr. Cook that went home to be with the Lord many years ago. Continue to walk with the King and be a blessing, blessing to those that God is going to bring into your circle. God bless. Spend a little time in quiet reflection as we end this time together. God bless.